to consider a few things. Sometimes distractions can interfere with our worship. Uh, might be distractions from something that happened yesterday, something that's going to happen tomorrow. Um, perhaps that comment your husband or wife made to you on the way to church today. Sometimes the distractions can be as simple as your position. Uh, normally, we're asked to stand for worship, but I'm going to suggest to you today that um, when we worship, we try to put ourselves in a position that will be the least distracting for you. If it's uh, more distracting for you to, to be standing, perhaps you've got some pain. I know I do. That's why I'm sitting here. If it's more... Um, if it will help you with your worship to sit, then by all means sit. If you feel that you need to stand in order to freely worship, then by all means stand. Um, but we want you to just try to remove all distractions as much as possible. We're going to begin with As the Deer. Yes.
King is exalted on high. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. King is exalted on high. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you may be seated. Welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church. I am really glad that our men are leading this morning as they did once before. And if you haven't noticed it yet, Chris wanted to fit in, so she's put on a mustache this morning. I was having a great morning watching her play the drums. <laughs> we are glad that you're here. We are here because we want to prayerfully build relationships so that we can impact lives with the transforming power of Christ for the growth of God's kingdom. And that's why we have church. That's why we have clubs. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have Bible studies. That's so that we can be equipped to do just that, but it requires that we get out and about and to reach others for Jesus. We do that locally and we also do that on a global scale through our uh, Great Commission Fund and through the support of our world international workers and missionaries. And so uh, I'm going to ask Marcia to come up and grab one of these mics. Uh, we are in the middle right now of our Faith Promise campaign, which is to raise funds for our global work. And she's going to explain what the hands out top there are and our update so far on that. Good morning. Good morning. We have raised so far with the Great Commission Fund, the Faith Promise Cards, $3,040. And we just started. So that's awesome. Um, our goal this year is to raise $11,000 for the Great Commission Fund. And the Great Commission Fund um, supports missionaries uh, Christian Mission Alliance missionaries around the world. And um, when we do the Great Commission Fund and the Faith Promise, we're saying this is what, um, in faith, we are pl um, promising to give. It's between you and God. Nobody's going to come and ask you for that money, so we ask that you would pray about it, make a decision. And then we turn in that number to um, the office, the national office, and they decide then what missions programs that they can fund, where they can send people. If, they, if we have a, a great response, maybe they can move into a new work. So it's really important that we get that money and then as, as we uh, go along through the year that we remember and, and contribute that money. So anyway, what we have up here are hands. And when I thought of these hands, I thought, they're kind of, these are hands that are reaching out for help initially, but then as they receive that help, they receive the gospel, those are hands that are now worshiping. So um, I thought that was kind of a, a neat idea. So each pair of hands represents a thousand dollars. And if you notice, each one of these hands is unique, just like we have all been created in, as individuals. They're, um, the hands that we've made for this, there are no two that are um, pairs that are exactly the same as another, just like God, God has made us special. So uh, at the end of the service today, right now we have the 3,040, so we have, you know, three sets of hands up there. At the end of the service, um, we will update that. And um, so if there's anybody that needs a Faith Promise card that would like to fill one out before the offering or get it somehow back to the ushers, you can do that. And then at the end, we are going to give a, an updated total. Okay? Thank you, Marcia. That's a great, great start. Uh, the Faith Promise cards are on the back table in the, in, inside the, service, the sanctuary here. One other announcement I'm going, to add, I'm going to share with you. The others are important. Read both what's happening this week and future things coming up. But I did want to highlight that uh, during the holiday season, both Thanksgiving and Christmas, 
People who are separated, people going through divorce or have just gone through a divorce, that is one of the hardest times for them to cope with the holidays because family structure has been decimated. And so we are providing uh, what's called divorce, uh, surviving the hol holidays, divorce care. It can be, doesn't have to be people who have been divorced. It could be they're just separated. It could be that they're having really hard issues and not living in the same frame of mind that they were before they need support. Uh, you, they are welcome to come as well. And that's gonna be taking place uh, November 5th here in our church. You have a flyer in your bulletin. If this doesn't affect you, don't throw the flyer out, but rather use it to invite someone that maybe you work with or someone you know that's going through a hard time in their relationship or has recently been divorced and they need support. Invite them to come to this and uh, they will find some real good uh, training and care uh, that will help, help them through the holidays. Okay, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward at this time, and we will continue to worship the Lord in the giving of our offerings and continue to sing praise to Him as well. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, uh, Lord, that you are a healer. And usually when we think about that term, we think about it in the physical form of our lives, disease or accidents or broken bones, these kinds of things. And we do know, God, you do heal from these injuries. But Lord, you also want to heal the heart and the emotions and relationships and friendships. So I pray especially, Lord, for this divorce care uh, holiday special, if you will, that people will come who are truly just lamenting the holidays because their life is in an uproar right now. I pray that you will prepare the leaders with the sensitivities that are necessary to reach out to these folks. And I pray, Lord, that if we know of someone who is in that category of life, in that season of life, that we'll reach out to them and invite them to be a part of this session. I also ask, Lord, that we will continue to live for you and to live for you in this world so that we can be the hands and feet, if you will, of Jesus. That when people see us, they'll see Christ in us and know that, Lord, there is, there is a possibility to find hope in the middle of what seems to be hopelessness and joy in the middle of sadness. But more importantly, that, Lord, there is everlasting life with God through Jesus Christ. Continue now to be blessed as we worship you in the giving of our tithes and offerings, as we hear the special music, and God, that we would just enter into that worship as they, as they share that we, Lord, are just blessed and praise you, and as we get to sing to you as well later on. We pray in your name. Amen. If you'd like to follow along with us on this song, you can turn in your hymnal to page number 619. Story is 
is pleasant to repeat what seems he's saying might tell it oh wonderfully sweet i love to tell the story for some that never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word, I love to tell the story, will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. Just speak. 
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 holy.
my fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I can stand and sing. I am a child of God. There is power. To break every chain, to break every chain. He breaks every chain, he breaks every chain, he breaks every chain. We're no longer slaves, we're no longer slaves, we're no longer slaves. He broke every chain, we're no longer slaves, we're children of weeks of the story this out of using this book as our textbook it's excerpts from the word of God from the Bible and we are going through from Genesis all the way to Revelation and talking about God's story which he sees with a different perspective than our story which we see from our perspective but how God desires to have a relationship with us the story begins with God creating a masterpiece universe that is very good and it's perfect and all that is within it is perfect. His shining jewel of creation is humanity, which is created in His image. And the only thing in creation that was created in His image, providing opportunity for humanity to have a loving relationship with our Creator. But humans rebelled against God and the relationship is broken. The curse of sin is bestowed upon humankind and we have been the living that curse ever since that time. The rest of the story that we are looking at is God designing and providing mankind with the means to restore the broken relationship so that we can be reconciled to God. God begins the restoration process by using the man Abraham to create the nation of Israel out of which will come the Savior Jesus. God demonstrates the power of forgiveness with a man called Joseph and through whom Israel grows in large number, in such large number that the country that welcomes them as guests turns them into slaves to keep them suppressed. A man called Moses then is raised up. He kills an Egyptian and escapes into the wilderness and that is where we pick up with a new commandment and a new covenant. Now all of this can be found in the book of Exodus. Deuteronomy and Leviticus and so I encourage you to read that from the Bible we are taking excerpts of it for our purposes of study during Sunday school as well as the worship service first of all we're going to look at what is called the new command the new command is actually an old command and is love God in Exodus 21 through 6 
we read these words, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant or your cattle or your sojourners who stay with you. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the new command that God gave through Moses is love God. Now let me backtrack before we get into the next part of the commandments. For those of you that didn't read your chapter, okay? And aren't familiar maybe with the story. Part of what we saw in the earlier cartoon version uh, of that song that talks about Moses and his experience was that when he was born, he was destined to die as a child because the Pharaoh had said all children, Israelite children, boys, uh, were to be, firstborns were to be executed. Instead, mother wraps him up and puts him in a basket that's pitched with tar and puts it in the river Nile where there's alligators and all those kind of things or crocodiles and then tries to hide it in the reeds but Pharaoh's wife sees the child and having compassion takes that child as her own, needs someone to nurse the baby. So sister Moses was watching and says, I know someone who could do that, and it was Moses' mom. So it was a unique way that God kept him in the family. And then later on as an adult, he's now a prince in, Pharaoh, in Egypt, and he kills an Egyptian, and he's caught. Someone saw him do it, and so he runs and tries to hide from the crime because he didn't want to be executed again he didn't want to be executed so now he's spared twice he goes out and becomes a shepherd I guess that's what you do when you uh, don't go to the circus you run away and be a shepherd out in the middle of nothingness and so that's what he did found a wife um, had children and lived out in a life as a shepherd and then God spoke to him in the burning bush and said, your job's not done yet. I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to release my people. And after a lot of argument, a lot of plagues and so forth, that's exactly what happened. And Pharaoh said, get these people out of here because of all his firstborns in that e Egypt died at the wrath of God. But they were spared. We talked about that last week. The Israelites were spared if they put the blood of the lamb, the, the sacrificial unblemished lamb, on their doorpost, then the angel of death would pass over that home and spare those children. And then he started celebrating from that moment on. Passover. So now they are have crossed through the Red Sea. You saw the picture where the sea split and they went through and they're on the other side now of the Red Sea and they're getting ready for their journey to the promised land and God wants to establish in them the law of God, the, the, the presence of God's character in them through the written word and the spoken word. So God tells Moses, gather all the people at Mount Sinai and, and I'm going to come down on the mountain. I'm going to give them these words. And so these millions of people gather around and they can't go too far because they're not supposed to go past and step on holy ground in an unworthy manner. And then God comes down and it says that the mountain is like electricity or lightning and willowing smoke and the earth is shaking, which means an earthquake. And the presence of God is felt and known. 
and he is going to give the commands and the people say to Moses why don't you speak to him on our behalf because we are too afraid we may die and so God speaks verbally to the Israelites and he gives them the commandments and then he calls Moses to leave them and to come up into the mountains so that he can give them those commandments in written form so they will not be forgotten or changed and while he's gone um, well, we'll get to that in a little bit part of the commandment the first four are you love God this is what I want my people to do I want you to love God to treat God well to respect God to revere God to live for God, to have a relationship with your Creator. And then he also says, I want you to love others, which is a character of God. In Exodus 20, 12 through 17, we continue with the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. That was the original commandments that were given by God for us, for our benefit. So that we would understand the character of God's holiness and also have a guidelines, if you will, Although it's more than guidelines, it's a commandment of how we are to live our life for His glory. Through the power of God enabling us to do that if we will surrender to it. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I give you one command. In essence, Jesus answered the question when people said, uh, Rabbi, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said in Mark 12, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is the one, even though there's two kind of thing, okay? This is what you want. Basically, he takes them back to the Ten Commandments. Love God, love others. And he established that for us. One of the things we discussed downstairs in our adult Sunday school class today, because we're going through this material also in class, our Sunday school classes. And if you don't go to class, I encourage you to come, whether it be adults or children's class. But in the class... We talked about the fact, it was mentioned, that the problem with modern day society is we're so enamored with God's grace, we forgot that God also is just. And that it's not the law is old and grace is good, it is the grace comes out of and complements the law. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And therefore, it's not just a rule book of do's and don'ts, and it makes me feel suppressed that God only wants me to do things I don't want to do and won't let me do things I want to do, but rather it's, it's to help us understand the character of God and to keep us in right relationship with God. And there are times when we fail those commands, and God's grace helps us to bring us back in line and forgives us when we ask Him to. That's the whole concept. Yeah, amen. That's the whole concept. Except we see the law of God in our generation, at least or many generations in the modern times, we see the law of God as almost impeding us rather than enhancing us of who we are in Christ Jesus. So Jesus comes along and says, basically, here's how, there's the greatest commandment. You love God, you love others. It's the same thing I told you thousands of years ago. But you do it with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. It becomes a natural 
part of who you are, an expression of who you are in every area of your life. If you desire to follow God. In the new covenant, then, we're called to be obedient and faithful. In Exodus, it says, now if you obey me fully, God now talking to the Israelites, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's still true today. We are God's chosen if we surrender to him through Jesus Christ. If we keep his covenants and live according to his purposes in him, we are his treasured possession. So think about this. This is the environment. They're standing at the foot of the mountain. They're seeing this this visual expression of God, not in a human looking form, but earthquake and billowing smoke and flames and lightning, and it's like, whoa, God is all powerful. They're so afraid, they're saying, Moses, you speak to him for us, okay? We're afraid we'll be killed if we try it. And God says, What I want is obedience and faithfulness. And here's the commandments. Love God and love others. And then God says, Moses, come up to the mountain. I'm going to give this to you in written form. And he walks up into all that smoke and everything. And he's there for a little over a month. And in that month's time, the Israelites go from awe and fear to, ah, he's dead. He ain't coming back. We need to, we need to create someone else. We need, to, we need to have a demonstration of somebody else that helped us, or the God that helped us out of Egypt. We need to create something. And so Aaron, his family member and co-priest, if you would, says, well, take off the jewelry, the gold from your earrings and necklaces and stuff, and we're going to melt it, and they create this golden calf in a 40-day period. This all happened in 40 days. They create this golden calf, They start to bow down and worship it. Then they start doing all kinds of revelry and dancing before it and making mockery of God. In the meantime, Moses is up in the mountain and God, with his finger, writes the tablets of stone and gives them to Moses. And he walks down the mountain and he gets past the smoke and all that kind of things and he sees what's going on and Moses has a meltdown. And he takes these tablets and he throws them to the ground and breaks them to pieces. And God brings judgment on the people that were there. Moses grinds up the cow, the golden calf, and puts it in liquid, makes them drink it. It was not a good day for the Israelites. And they did it in 40 days. From awe and fear of God to we really don't need him anymore. We'll create God in our image. What we think he should look like. And how we can act instead of how he wants us to act. Remember the commandment God said. Now remember, they haven't gotten it in written form yet. That's why Moses went up the mountain. But when God came down to them, he said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you to the land of Egypt. You will have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or earth or beneath or under the water. You shall not worship them or serve them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And here they are building an idol, a substitute for the true almighty God and worshiping it. And I would love to say that those rascals are so much different than we are today. But the reality is God says the rules then, the commandments then are the same today. That we love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength and we love one another. 
and we treat people with respect and dignity and introduce them to God through the visibility, if you will, of God in human form because Christ is in us. Not that we are God. We are not. But we have God in us if we surrender to Jesus Christ. And yet, you and I all know that we have those days and we have those moments where we tell a little white lie because we, you know, we're Christians. We don't tell black lies. We just tell little white lies. That maybe we cheat in our taxes. Maybe we look at somebody in an inappropriate manner. Maybe we listen to stories or jokes or whatever that God is offended by. Maybe we, we kind of cheat a little bit with someone gives us the wrong change instead of correcting them and giving it back. We keep it. Maybe we yell at somebody. Maybe we want to get even. Maybe we hold bitterness. These are all things of the golden calf, if you will. God says, I want you to love me with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love others in a way that demonstrates the love of God. And when I came to faith in Christ, I was four, fourth grade and I was, I was just delighted. I understood finally at four, in fourth grade that I only had to give my life to Christ once and I would be redeemed from my sins. I didn't have to keep giving it to him every day because I'm afraid it was gone. It, God comes and resides in us. That's how he works this miracle of hope in our life. But he does call us, he called me and you, if you've done that, to live a life then every day after that that glorifies God. And even though I was amazed in fourth grade at my salvation, I didn't remain sinless. I didn't never sin again. I've sinned a lot since those days. And so have you. But we want to come back to the cross. We want to come back to Jesus. We want him to write the law, his law, on our hearts. And that's what the scripture is telling us then. That we are to live in obedience and faithfulness to him. Exodus 3, or 34, 6 through 7 says, In this encounter of 40 days, and they started to sin within that 40 days again. Then the Lord passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgive, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. In other words, there is consequence for our rebellion, our sin. It isn't just like, well, I'll sin. God's gracious. He'll let me sin. He won't care. He will care. We are held accountable for every wrongdoing. Now, the nice thing is that when we come to God and we realize that we have failed him, it says that he will forgive our sins and throw them as far as the east is from the west. In other words, they will, that will not come back. But there's still consequence for wrongdoing. Consequence of sin, First, 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him, to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, does God take a sin that I did, and I asked him to forgive me, and that's been washed and covered under the blood? Does he pull it back up and go, look? No. He's taken that as far as the east is from the west. But when we become careless, like the Israelites did, and begin to kind of just do our thing, counting on God to go ahead and forgive us because he's such a loving God, and then we forget about those things, or we overlook those things, and then we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, God will not forget those things. And there will be judgment. I don't know what it is. He's not going to take away our salvation. But there will be judgment for any unconfessed and dealt with sins here in this world. That's the consequence of sin. 
And that's what God was trying to get across, is I love you. I want you to walk in glory and hope and, 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 in, and in purity. But if you violate that, I can't overlook that. I am a God of justice and I'm a God of love. I have grace and I have mercy. My mercy is for you. But don't misuse that. It's a part of the entire love package that I have for you. And so with that new covenant, we have the presence of the Lord. It's another thing that we read in this story, in in this chapter that we read. Chapter 5, the new covenant, new command. One of the things that stood out for me was that God said these words, and he says it more than once through the scriptures. I want to be with you. I want, he says, I want the presence of the Lord. I want to be with you. In Genesis, it says that, that God came down and walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He walks with man and woman until they sin. And there's the violation of sin. And there's the consequence of sin. And there's, there's the breaking of the relationship. And there's the cur- that because of that, curse is brought upon the world. And all of us are born with sin. And we choose to violate God from time to time. God says, I want to restore that relationship. My intent was to create you so I could have relationship with you. But sin separates. In Exodus chapter 25 through chapter 31, God describes how to build and maintain the temple. He talks about all the elements that go inside the temple. He talks about the priests and how they're supposed to dress and how they're supposed to conduct themselves. He spells it out very much for the people of Israel and where his presence is to dwell in the temple. In the New Testament context, we live a little bit differently because Christ came down to us. Again, God came to us. And then says, I came that I might die on your behalf and pay the penalty for your sin. And then if you will receive me unto yourself, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. For now, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, it says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know, and this is the part I want to emphasize, do you not know that your body, if you have accepted Christ into your life, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? It is no longer a temple made with brick and mortar. It is now our flesh. And when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. Your body is a a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You'll say, well, what was the price? It was the death of the Savior. He purchased us with his sacrificial life on the cross. And when we believe that and receive that, surrender to that ourselves, then the Spirit of God dwells in us. And God wants His temple holy. God desires for us to be reconciled in relationship and presence. In John 14, Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God... Believe also in me, Jesus said. If you believe in the Father, believe also in me. In my Father's house, where my Father dwells, what we call heaven, are many dwelling places. King James calls them mansions, but I think they're better than that. But that's the only thing we could really describe. You know, if you don't live in a mansion, you always think that'd be something, wouldn't it? Maybe not. Not if you have to clean it. This one you don't have to clean. God's already cleaned it all out, okay? In my house, in my heaven, in my home are many dwelling places. And Jesus said, if that was not so, I would have told you. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return. I am coming again so that where I am, you may be also. Heaven is not the goal. It's only a dwelling place. The goal is to be reconciled with God. 
through Jesus Christ. And then we receive the promise. Don't be worried about the future. Because I've gone to prepare a place for you. It's all set up. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And we will live together in God's home. I don't know exactly what that's going to be like. The Bible does talk about the fact that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and that we will be used in God's work. I, don't, I cannot explain to you because I don't know. It's not revealed exactly how that will work. But the point of this is not that I get to go to heaven. That's a bonus, if you will. The goal is I get to be reconciled with God here on earth and for all eternity. If I believe and receive Jesus for myself and repent of my sins, asking Christ to forgive me and to take residence in my life. When he does, remember we're talking about the commandments, the scripture says he inscribes those commandments on our heart. Like the story in Exodus, this story, humanity continues to rebel against God. The Israelites were not the only ones that have ever rebelled against God. Even those who love God and are called according to His purpose have rebelled against Him. Therefore, He warns us to be obedient as well as provides for us to be faithful. And this is the wonder of God. He calls us to obedience, but empowers us, gives us the power to be faithful. The warning is in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he hates the one and loves the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth, or God and the world. We must choose who we're going to serve. But the provisions given to us, as we read in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, you are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by men, being manifest that you are a letter of Christ, cared for us, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. We carry in us, those of us who have surrendered to Jesus as Savior, we carry in us the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, Jesus' Spirit. And He writes on our hearts how we're supposed to live so that when we are in a position to make a decision that might offend God or please God, we will know which decision to make. That doesn't mean we will always make the right decision because self always wants what it wants. But God empowers us to know the difference between sin and holiness and gives us the ability to choose whether or not we're going to surrender to God or to ourself. Basically, we're told, choose who you're going to serve. You can't serve both. We can't. If we have God in us, if we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, then we are to maintain holiness in that temple. And that comes by surrendering to God every day. As the worship team comes forward, I'm going to ask a question before we start the music. And Marsha's going to put up the hands in just a moment as well as when we sing. But I just want to ask a question. Number one, you're sitting here today. Are you in a position where you know that you have Christ in you because you have surrendered to him? and asked him to forgive you of your sins and said, Lord, I want you to take residence in my life. I want to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The second question is, if you have done that, are you in a position today where you can say, God, I feel so honored that I'm in a position right now where I'm walking in holiness, that I have nothing to hide or try to hide from God that I am where I'm supposed to be because the Word of God's written in my heart and I'm in a right position in relationship with you. If that is no to either one of those, then I want to pray a prayer right now before we sing. And you can pray silently if this prayer meets your need. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this 
understanding of your story, your desire to come down and dwell among us and in us. Your desire to give us the commandments that we live by grace so people can see the holiness of God lived out in humanity so they will be attracted to you as well. Lord, there may be someone here today that understands, God, that you exist, but they've never asked you to forgive them of all their sin, to cleanse them from their unrighteousness. They've never said to you, Jesus, I surrender to you, and I am now yours. While we're all still praying, if there's anyone that wants to do that, while your eyes are still closed, and you just want me to acknowledge that before God, and then we can talk later about that personally. Was there anyone that needs to make that decision today to come to Jesus? Raise your hand. Father, you know the hearts of men and women. And I pray that's true, that this morning everybody here has a personal relationship and has been saved through you. Lord, I also pray for those that this morning may be here in church, and I'm so glad that they are. But Lord, they're struggling with something. Maybe they're hiding something that they watch on the internet. Maybe they're having real problems at home with their relationships. Maybe, Father, they're harboring bitterness towards somebody that's done something to them long ago or just a little while ago. But they're not in a position where the temple, if you will, is completely pure. But today they want it to be pure. Lord, I just pray that they will pray this prayer in their hearts. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to cling to this because I feel so wronged. But I don't want it to interfere with my relationship with you. So I ask you to forgive me for harboring these things. And I put it at the foot of the cross. And now, Lord, with your help, I walk away. Please forgive me. And now, Lord, restore me in my pure relationship with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, or you need to talk about your relationship with the Lord, please feel free to talk with me or talk with our elders or deaconesses. Um, if, you want, if, if you want prayer, you, just, you, you go back in the back room and we'll notice that you go back there if you want to pray with somebody and I'll send someone back, a male or female, to pray with you. Um, the important thing is that you do something with that. It's one thing to confess to God, but sometimes if it's uh, you know, something that goes on between us and another person, God may be saying, now you need to go to the other person and try to make that right. They may not accept it, but at least you've done your part on my behalf. And if that's the case, then I encourage you to go to that person or that situation and make it right to the best of your ability. And let God be blessed with that action. Would you please stand now as we sing together? And also, uh, Marsha, where are you? She's going to... Um, uh, ap- hey, you can put that up there, and she's going to put the hands up. Thank you very much. Praise God. We are that close to our goal, 11,000.
Jesus' name we pray. Amen.